All right. Welcome in, everyone. A little look behind the scenes as we get ready for a little Chatterbox Bearcats. I already see the chat. Chatterbox Bearcats. Bearcats? Off-season, oh, baby. Off-season. Oh. I'll tell you what. I got to promote the brand right out of the gate. That's This is when we get all the viewers rolling in. Download Chatterbox <laughs> Bearcats. It's all under the same umbrella. What's up, Kirby? How we doing? Uh, 9-5 Brewers up as we head to the top of the ninth at Great American. Yeah, not a, not ideal. Yeah. Uh, one of those nights they've kind of made it, I guess, a little interesting. So I guess there's there's that that we got going on. It's nine five, man. This is the uh, the Rally Reds going up against uh, Abner Uribe, who's got a six seven five ERA. Let's show Uribe. He's got a two sixty seven opponent average. Ty like Stevenson it. steps up to the plate, takes the pitch on the outside corner, strike one. Would you think in the uh, fourth inning that call on who was it? It was on. Uh, it was the outside pitch that got the Reds out of the rally, second and third. It was Martini. What'd you think of that pitch? Was that a ball? I honestly, I honestly might have missed this one. First couple innings were a little sketchy. Uh, Your father. Six forty starts as a yes. as a father are 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 tough. Uh, I will say. So usually, like the 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 fourth and fifth innings when they're in the six forty start, those are usually my most fuzzy points of the game. And uh, tonight was fuzzy, but I'm pulling it up. Tyler Stevenson rocks one into left field. Stevenson's aboard, and the Reds are cooking with Crisco in the bottom of the ninth inning, down 9-5. Not really cooking with Crisco, but there's a runner on board. I got a bone to with pick Presco. with the New York Mets, those jackasses in New York. You know that vending machine that went viral, Kirby? You loved it. That's a family vending machine. I did not like it. Um, <laughs> yes, that is my brother's vending machine that just no. uh, was broadcasted to the millions. Yeah, he, he called me. He's like, what about your jackasses? Those guys in New York, they got a buffet upstairs. That's for the overnight workers that have nothing else to eat but the chicken salad. They're going to broadcast it and make it a mockery. So it was a tough week for the Walter family. It happens to the best. Pitch to Indy outside corner at 100 miles per hour. Rebe can fling it. 1-1. One, one. <laughs> that is uh that's incredible. I, I can't believe you saved that for the show too. You didn't you didn't text me and tell me. You saved it. You wanted a a clean, honest reaction. That's big league. I originally retweeted oh. it. I thought it was hysterical. And then my brother texted me. He's like, Don't give in to that <laughs> propaganda. That's BS. <laughs> hey man, I look there it's uh it's a vending machine. Like you know, it's better than nothing, right? No, oh, I mean, I lived, you know, I lived off that stuff. Come on. I mean, you know, you're there at 11:30 at night trying to write a, a recap of the game. There's nothing opened, and you have an option. Yeah, when you see a vending machine though that doesn't have the credit card reader, I mean, I don't know how those things stay in business. When's the last time you've had coins on you? Not often. Not often. Or the dollar bill? Very rare. Three one to India. Oribe. From the stretch with his blue glove. Outside corner, they call it a strike. Oh, who's blue behind the plate tonight? Oh, you have that on hand? That's a bad call. Oh, um, Paul Clemens. Paul, you suck. Yeah, Paul hasn't that, had a great that night. One, that one was a ball. Actually, the one we were talking about, Martini, I checked it. It's a strike if there's a robot ump, so I can't complain. It was it was right on the cusp. It was right on the cusp. Yeah. But that one did touch. So, On today's show, a little tease of what we have for you. A tribute to the great TJ Antone, who says today that he is not done. He's going for the third Tommy John, and he's looking to be an inspiration to so many. We have reaction from him. Uh, verbally as Jonathan India walks first and second, a boop and a blast, and this thing could be tied up, folks. Or or as Trace likes to say, a bleeder and a blast, because errors count too. We'll take errors. We're not greedy around here. There you go. Now now we're not now we're not playing any uh we're not playing any, any copyrighted music on here, right? Because this is a a established show that we make a whole like ten bucks off on ads, so yeah, we, no, we can't I've, we can't be losing that. We can't be. Losing I've got that nothing. Job. I've got nothing for you. And uh, you told me I can't cuss, which I think is a bunch of. I'm not gonna say it, but uh, you let us what? cuss on Chatterbox Bearcats, the Reds. There's you guys certain. Have good numbers. There's certain. There's certain words. There's certain words. I think you know what they are. Yeah. 
I'm allowed to call the it, Mets a bunch of jackasses. Jackass is okay. Jackass is acceptable. It also is more acceptable uh, when we're watching live than uh, than, okay. than the podcast. It just makes a Benson. lot more work for me. Oof. Oh, man. If the Reds can do it. So, Benson, this is where I wish that uh, we had Ellie and Steer in the three and four hole instead of the six and seven hole. And I'll never understand that. That's a rant for later on in the show. If the Reds end up going down in this game and don't get to six and seven it's why you put your best hitters at the beginning of the order traditionally but now these analytics guys Uh-oh. have to come in and they need the yep three two or excuse me i'm way off in the count one one man i i get it from tom this week calling calling me an analytic freak I'm getting it from you on a tuesday man it's just it's it's still a tough tough living out here you're a numbers guy I just spew a bunch There's of nonsense. There's a price to pay. Hope that no There's a price to it. pay. <laughs> Benson down low, two and one. Will Benson in the catbird seat, everyone? Oh, they got to get a rebate out of there. Nah, keep him in there. He's shaky. Oh, the, there's no Devin Williams back there. Two one. Benson on the ground fouls it two two. Oh, you're a little ahead of me. Somehow you you caught up and passed me. You took a lead on turn three. Aribe, deep breath into the 2-2. Outside corner. Ooh, that was right on the black. Uh, that, that makes up right for the, uh, the, the Indian one. Yeah, makes up for the martini one that apparently it must strike. It must just be the that that side of the plate is. Uh, <laughs> he's just got it. He, he's like my camera. It's not centered. Three two, <laughs> in the air foul, and it's into the seats. These shows are hard to prep for, though. You know, it's just uh, you prep an entire show assuming they're going to lose 9-2, to two, and then they may load up the bases. 3-2. Benson so swing, don't, don't got a piece of it. Takes off for first, long throw, and there's an out. Second and third, Man. one out. That's tough. If you would have if you would have caught that right away, he might have been able to beat that. He would have beat it for sure. The pitch squirted past the catcher and got caught in the uh, the buttocks area of the ump behind home plate. Benson got a piece of it though, man. That's oh, if you were, the ball got like lodged. Did you see it got like lodged in between? What's them? going on here? What's going on here? Why is Skipper out? And who is Skipper? That's no longer Craig Counter. Who manages the Brewers? Uh, Thompson. Thompson. Get him out of here. Hit the showers, Thompson. Now here comes David Bell. It's a game of chess with the umps. I have no idea what the hell went on there. I thought he got a piece of it. I, I don't think he got a here? And no, I, I don't think he got a piece of it. But the the ball kind of got stuck in in between like his under almost under his arm. I don't know if I don't know the rule on that. Uh, shout out baseballrulesacademy.com. <laughs> it's probably somewhere on there, although I've never seen it on there. I, I don't know if that's obstruction because it did like it kind of almost caught for a split second. Hold on. They're sending it down to Jim Day. What? Jim, what do you see down there? I don't have a clue. Where's Welsh? All right. I, I, they thought it was foul. The mess has been sorted out. Still runners at second and third. Reds need another runner aboard for the tying run to come up to the plate. Well, it would make sense why Will didn't run if he thought he got a piece of it. I thought he got a piece of it. I, that, I thought initially. I don't, it's hard There's to see. There's Encarnacion Strand. Swings at a first pitch fastball and laces it foul. 0-1. 
Couple singles today for Encarnacion Strand, who raises his average to a buck sixty-seven on the season. Any concern with uh, Encarnacion Strand right now, Kirby? No, I do not raise any concerns for players until we get to May. Until May, it's a hard rule. That's fair. So Nick Castellanos in my fantasy I, I league, who I think has I two say, points at this point. I should I should keep him on the roster for now and not panic and drop him for Connor Joe. I, I should I should have said concern. I, I wouldn't panic on anyone. I mean, I think you can. You can see signs that are not good. Uh, this is who CES is. He swings at everything. He he said he said he said a lot of uh, he said a lot of hard hit balls that have kind of not not amounted to much. Swing and a miss. Reds have had two outs since I put on the rally cap. It's coming off. <laughs> All right. So who we got? Jamer. Yep. Jamer Candelario to keep the game alive. Keep hope alive. Be nice to get Frilly to play it. I don't. I don't know if I want. I would think they'd have to have a lefty warming. Yeah, dude. Why didn't Benson run there? Chat's right. Well, if he thought he got a piece of it, that's what. You know, if he thought that he foul tipped it, that would kind of make sense. Don't you hear Blue behind you going ha and take off as soon as he says that though, whether you got a piece or not? No. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Back in my playing days, I was safe on a lot of those plays because the catchers couldn't throw to first. But obviously, it's a it's a different game at the major league level. But that one, in particular, he would have been safe. Uh, Megan in the chat, uh, Trace is uh, was producing and uh, was part of the talent for the pregame show for the Joe Nuxall Classic, uh, UC Xavier College uh, baseball game today. He's a man of many hats. Candelario, that one was right down the middle. Arebe gets out of the jam. Brewers nine, Cincinnati Reds five. Hop in here, everyone. Let's do a show. Let us do a show. Final score, Brewers nine, Reds five. Johnny Bench has tied it up. The Cincinnati Reds win the World Series in four straight. It was a sweep. In the dirt, it's a wild pitch. Here comes Foster. The Reds win the pennant. Clark won the game. That ball is fair. Cincinnati's ahead. Two games to go. Welcome, Joe Randa, to Cincinnati. Adam Dunn has done it again. Benzinger backing and calling, and the 1990 World Championship belongs to the Cincinnati Reds. Marty, yes. This is Adam from Milwaukee. Hey, Adam, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Do you think Scott Hedenberg is a good player? Done up there with the bases loaded, the outfield deep and around toward right, and the 1-0 on the way to the plate. Swing on, long drive, right field, and this one belongs to the Reds. And a high drive. Hit back into deep right field. And De La Cruz is, oh my goodness, look at this kid run. My, oh my, that is a triple. Matt McClain's first big league bomb. Spencer Steer's first big league hit is a home run to straightaway center field. Votto's done it again. The pitch. Votto swings high in the air. Right field. Yes! He pointed to the dugout to say, I told you. That is Joey Votto's 315th career. Go ahead, Rivy. Only Johnny Bench had more as a red. And I can't tell you how much it means to play in front of Everyone here in Cincinnati, as a Red, uh, what a gift. What a tremendous gift. So thank you. Thank you. I think I can speak for all of Red's country. Joey Votto, thank you.
Homer Bailey. Round ball to third. Frazier gloves. Throw to first and Homer Bailey for the second time in his major league career. All right, Chuck Walter, Nick Kirby with you. Final score out of Great American Ballpark. Brewers improved to 7-3. and three. They score 9. Cincinnati falls to 6-5 and five on the season. They score 5 in the game. I want your opening thought on this, Curbs. Entering today, the Reds, 15th in hitting, 16th in pitching, 25th in fielding. You look at those numbers. Statistically, I know you love the stats, Kirby. Point Dexter. Statistically, we're looking at average baseball team. Which of those three will the Reds by season's end or in the next few weeks or in the next few months turn it around to where they will not be average and be better than average in one of those statistics? Or are we looking at an average baseball team that right now is slightly above average at 6-5? and five? Welcome, my friend. Uh, good to have you, Chuck. A little better than last week. Uh, we're still 0-2, but... Uh... Uh, last week was really rough, so this was only like a slightly rough one. So I think we're having some progress, some some positivity there. Uh, the pitching, no question about it. I, I think that this team, and I've said it a million times, so I apologize to those that have heard me say this over and over, but uh, the Reds pitching, I think, is going to wear down a lot of teams in baseball because the Reds have a lot more depth. So while it may not in the month of April really wow you, like they may be middle of the pack in, in ERA, the Reds aren't going to have to dip into uh, a lot of the guys, quite frankly, they dipped into last year. They're not going to need starts out of guys like, like with all due respect, Brett Kennedy or those type of pitchers, the guys they get out of independent ball because they have more um, quality arms like Carson Spires tonight. Um, he, he's a guy that the Reds just have it at their disposal at any point. So I think when you get into July and August, that's when the Reds are going to wear down some of the teams like the Cardinals that have nowhere even close to the amount of pitching depth that the Reds have. Let's take a big positive away. One, the Brewers have killed the Reds for years. They've been a kryptonite, it's felt like. They took 6-7 of seven last year at Great American Ballpark, and we're looking at a rubber match tomorrow. That's a positive. The big positive entering tomorrow's game and entering the upcoming series is that they got a pretty fresh bullpen, right? Frankie Montas, not his best game whatsoever. He goes five, four innings from Spires, who just got shelled but kept throwing pitches. I think the final tally was up near 80. It was, you get a hit, and you get a hit, you get an extra base hit, and everyone was getting hits. It was a merry-go-round on the base path, but at the end of the day, Spires, I mean, I know that his runs were kind of the difference in the game, but take away that, take away the facts, and um, you'll, you'll take it from Spires to at least eat up some innings. I'm never going to really be too critical of a guy's uh, line when he throws 81 pitches out of the bullpen. I think that Really, whatever you do, you get a pass on uh, when you go over 50 pitches uh, as a reliever um, because you're just in there to eat innings. And that was his his main job. The Reds were out of the game, you know, when he came in. Uh, so, look, I, I think he's a nice, nice arm. I don't think he's a guy you you want to have in your starting rotation, but he's a guy that, that you can mix and match. I think he kind of fills the, the Ben Lively role for the Reds last year. And, and the Ben Lively role, actually, I think – ended up being a really valuable role for the Reds deep into the season. Run through the entire box score for me. What's going on? Well, we got a thrilling ball game here uh, there today. Uh, Frankie Montas, the the first uh, start with the Reds where he wasn't sharp. Um, he gave up three runs in the third. or Sorry, yeah, three runs in the third. Then he gave up two more unearned runs in the fifth. A little bit of a bad throw by Ellie on a double play ball. Um play that Jonathan India should have made at second base. I think if you're maybe Ellie De La Cruz, uh, you got to know who's playing second base. It's not Matt McLean who's going to you know help you make up some of your mistakes. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Montas, five innings, six hits, uh, five runs, three earned in this one. As, as mentioned, Carson Spires came in to eat it through 81 pitches. So shout out to him. The Reds didn't have to uh, uh, use any other relievers. Uh, Reds offense, uh, Chuck, they had 10 hard-hit balls off Joe Ross, but they only had two runs to show for it. 
Uh, they did try to make a rally late, ended up uh, cutting it down to a four-run ball game, had the tying run on deck in the ninth inning. But Reds fall 9-5, and uh, Joe Ross, that was his first big league win since June 29th, 2021. So shout out to him. We didn't have any uh, deep drives today. I-, I didn't even look up the hardest, the longest fly ball tonight. Not going to do it. Uh, our deep drive of the day, sponsored by DSC Commodities. DSC is a leader in renewable commodities for biofuel production. They specialize in used cooking oil collection, aggregation, and sales. Visit www.deepsouthcommodities.com for more information. Thanks, as always, to our friends at DSC, and hopefully we'll have about five deep drives to talk about tomorrow. Hopefully Christian Yelich doesn't have one of those deep drives. Uh, I'll tell you what, man. For years, we've been talking about Reds killers. I've been talking about Reds killers. I don't know if you have personally, Kirby, but Bill Hall and Lance Berkman and Albert and Eckstein and Roy Oswald and the entire Boston Red Sox team from the year like 2003 to 2020, it felt like Kyle Schwarber, Ian Happ, the list goes on and on of players that just wake up against Cincinnati. Christian Yelich kills a lot of different teams, but against the Red Legs, 78 RBI in 118 games against the Reds. I want your honest opinion here. When Yelich kind of went down a, a not great path playing baseball years ago to where it seemed like he was right around that ripe age of when players fall off for a season or two and, and never really come back, and you say, oh, it was just age. You know, he hit 32, 33 and was never the same player. Did you think that he could get back to this point? And what is it about him that makes him so damn good at the plate? I, I did not. I mean, I thought in uh, in 2021, I think that was the year he really dipped down. Uh, I thought that was probably the beginning of the end. But but to his credit, he, he has bounced back. Um, I still would not want to have his contract if I was the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, he's still got like I think four or five years left, like twenty something million. Right, years. right now. Um, I. Yeah, he's he's 32. I he 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 was good. He was pretty good last year, but. I still don't think he he's at the production level that that you would want out of uh, that that kind of contract. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, they're also having to DH him a lot now, so he's not really giving them any value in the field either. I think his defensive numbers have have fallen off quite a bit. The last two years have actually been pretty rough whenever they have put him out in the field. So that has declined uh, quite a bit. Um, but I, I, I probably should should save any Christian Yelich slander for at least two more days. Uh, until we get to the end of this series. Good and the bad, Kirby. Let's start with the bad from me. Uh, the good is, uh, obviously, we'll get into Ellie De La Cruz. He looks fantastic once more today. Uh, the other good is watching on TV, not in Cincinnati currently. Can't wait to get to some games this summer, but just hearing Joe Z's voice. Now batting for the Reds. You know, I mean, you can hear it on the Game Time app. It's like, Reds, Reds, pucker up. It's time for the kiss cam. But um, the bad. Man, Joe Z, the good, Ellie De La Cruz, the good, the bad, the Cincinnati Reds bullpen consistently. When is the last time? And this is another stump to Kirby. I got you last time with the uh, with the, uh, the the trade from the Montreal Expos to the Cleveland Indians or Cleveland Guardians, where you did not know that it was Grady Sizemore that was in that trade. But here's a little stump to Kirby for you. When is the last time you think the Reds have had a top 13 bullpen ERA in baseball? That's a good one. Does twenty twenty count? No, and they they weren't there anyways. They 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 weren't they weren't there in twenty twenty. Okay, um, just throw out a year. Maybe twenty twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen, close. It was twenty thirteen. So we're talking over a decade of consistently okay. mediocre bullpens, and I know that they make some moves. I know that over the years we've we've gone with the Coco Corderos. We've you know brought in Araldis Chapman. We we brought in Ryan Madsen, who never pitched a game for the Reds. Uh, we went with Strope. They bring in this year Suter and some other guys. So they they've at least made a little bit of an effort. But it's like putting Flex Seal on the Titanic, man. How is it that every single year, consistently, the only constants in Cincinnati are Cheese Coney's, Getta, and a god awful bullpen? I mean, it's. It's atrocious. At some point, you think in the offseason, they'll be like, you know what? Our bullpen sucks year after year. It's been between 15 and 30 for 
two decades now. Maybe we should go out there and get some arms for the back end of the bullpen. And, and once again, I'm just feeling like it's going to be a roller coaster ride of a season for the Reds. They're going to blow a lot of leads again, man. And I know today they didn't have the chance to blow any leads because they were down from the get-go. But do you see that same thing that I see? And um, how do we go about getting some dudes in the bullpen? I I think the Reds' bullpen's pretty good. Uh, I I, I think there was some that maybe went a little overboard and thought it was You're a numbers guy, Kirby. Pretty good. It's mediocre at best year after year after year. We know this. They never have a good bullpen. The bullpen last year was pretty good for the first three or four months of the year. They got absolutely torched in in September, but uh, the bullpen was the strength of the team for a large port- portion of the, of the year. And, and I think that, I mean, the Reds, they had a lot of games where they were using openers last year, and I, I think some of the numbers got skewed. I think if you look individually, pitcher by pitcher, I think you could feel a lot better about the bullpen than if you just look at the the the, the total numbers. I mean, last year um, you had Alexis Diaz, who was absolutely great until until September. Um, I don't know. Let me pull him up here. I mean, you had Alexis Diaz a three point zero seven ERA. Jabo was three point three three. Lucas Sims was three point one zero. Alex Young was sub four. Derek Law was three point six zero. They they had a lot of quality. Sam All had a zero point seven three ERA. So they had, I mean, about four or five guys that had really good years, and and they have built the bullpen up a little bit more this year, um, adding uh, Emilio Pagan, um, and uh, and and some so, some other guys. So I, I think the bullpen overall is is, is pretty solid. Uh, and uh, so what was the, what was the number of the top? You said top thirteen. Top thirteen. I'm not even asking for a top ten. I'm just asking for a, a top fifteen. A they're going to do it. Bullpen. They're going to do it this year. They'll be mediocre. Yeah, they're going to do it mediocre. this year. But I mean, Texas is a rare occasion last year where a team overcame a pretty bad bullpen to an average bullpen and won. But you look consistently at the teams that have won the World Series or competed for World Series championships the last twenty years, and they all have one thing in common. It's like the offensive line in football. You don't talk about it, but good teams win in the trenches. Good teams finish out games. They have great bullpens. I I don't know, man. At at a certain point, it just feels like a a constant, and I know that the bullpen didn't do much today um, aside from Spires. He was the only guy that came out of the pen, went four innings, gave up, what, four runs in the game. Um, So, again, not the greatest numbers in the world right there. Uh, Three earned runs. But that is over 81 pitches, so you'll take that from Spires in his four innings. But it just seems like it's a uh, it, it's a it's a phenomenon that I can't really explain. Since I was a young boy, going to Synergy Field, sneaking down from the red seats to the blue seats, sprinting past ushers, doing spin moves, I, I've consistently seen the bullpen doors swing open. Todd Coffey sprinting out to get shelled, and uh, it just it feels it always feels cheap. It always feels like they just slapped this thing together, and, and that's pretty disrespectful to a bullpen that you're right did pitch pretty well last year, and statistically maybe online to be pretty good this year. But it just it, it feels that way to me. Like I, I never trust the Reds bullpen, and I'm not the only one. I see people in the chat saying preach. Yeah, I it just I, I would encourage you to look through individually last year and not just not just the total number. I mean, you look at the guys that had some there's some enormous ERAs out of out of uh, uh some of the relievers like Eduardo Salazar at an ERA of 8. He's not even in the Reds organization anymore. Reaver San Martin was over 7. Um the the list goes on. There's tons of guys that are not going to pitch this year. Um, and to the Reds' credit, they did pay $8 million for Emilio Pagan um, as a reliever this year, which is not common for the Reds. They also went and got Brent Suter. Uh, I know he was a little bit, you know, he was a cheaper option, but um, they did put a lot more effort into this bullpen uh, than than they have in years past. But even having said that, the, the best relievers are actually still guys on their, their uh, you know, first uh, rookie contract. So, um, but I, I do think, I think this is the year. I get the the frustration because it does feel like the Reds have made the bullpen a back burner um, for, for decades, for a lot of, for, for yeah, for the last decade. But I will I would caution you that you don't also want to go too far on a bullpen because there's a lot of teams and you can look through 
team after team after team that, that tried to just buy free agent relievers. And I don't think that's a good strategy at all. Uh, a team that always comes to mind is the Colorado Rockies. There was one year they literally threw like $80 million at three relievers and they all ended up sucking. They all were terrible because relievers are, are, are volatile. So for the Reds, I don't think it's necessarily as much about spending a ton of money in free agency on your bullpen. It's about drafting and developing quality relievers. And the Brewers are the perfect example. They have one of the world's cheapest bullpens. If you look at their salary year after year after year, they're probably one of the cheapest uh, bullpens by salary, but they just keep pumping out guys, pumping out guys. And then they can even trade a guy like Josh Hader when he gets towards the end of his contract because the guys behind them are, are good. And I think the Reds are trending that way. We, we've seen a lot of pitchers come up recently that, that have really, really nasty stuff. And I hope that that continues to be a trend because that's, I think, how the Reds have to uh, have to uh, uh, make their bullpen. I've been holding in that bullpen rant for about five years now, so I had to get it out. Uh, the real bad, not the bullpen. It's Jamer Candelario, not off to a good start. You're hopeful that a guy that's been in the majors for years, that hit at every stop of the minor leagues, that was a pretty good prospect, that you know has a track record of being good, figuring it out, and quite frankly being a little bit streaky, uh, like you saw last year when he was so hot with the Cubs out of the gate and then just fizzled down the stretch. But you hope that uh, a really tough start is going to turn around for Jamer. That's my bad. What's your bad before we get into the uh, the good from today? Uh, the defense is the bad. I mean, I don't. It wasn't as bad today. Easy. I mean, That's I, an easy I do one. think that. Yeah, uh, the the defense is w was my biggest concern coming into the year after you lost uh, McLean and Friedel. Um, I, I think it's definitely a concern with this team. I'm not as concerned individually. I don't. I think Ellie De La Cruz is going to be fine defensively. I think he had a bad couple weeks. And it got magnified because it's right at the beginning of the year. Uh, but the Reds have subpar defenders at six, seven positions on on most nights, and uh, that's just that that's tough. Um, I do think that's something the Reds have worked hard to address um, with guys like Matt McLean and like DJ Fredo and like Noel V. Marte, um, and behind them like Edwin Arroyo. And uh, if you look at the Dayton Dragons roster, they have a ton of athletes that I think are going to be good defenders. But the Reds, they didn't prioritize defense for uh, for for too long, um, and uh, it it has it has caught up with them. I think a lot in recent years, but I hope that's something that they do continue to improve upon. We're hearing from the chat, Jamer Mustakis. That's terrifying, right there. Um, haven't seen it yet, but equally as bad would be a uh, Shogo Condelario. That one would be tough, too. Uh, we, we've seen some deals go through in, in previous years that have not been good, but every player is different. Every year is different. We're just getting started. Like Nick Kirby says, his rule of thumb, I asked him when he would start to get scared that Christian Encarnacion Strand has yet to walk in 11 games, has struck out a boatload, and has an OPS below 400, I believe. And um, his answer was what it is every year. Every year since... Nick Kirby was a young lad back in 2001. He's been saying, we don't panic until May. He's like John Rothstein, you know? John Rothstein goes to sleep in May. Nick Kirby wakes up in May, shoots his eyes open, and um, makes sure that he has quality control at that point. But no worries from you there. Uh, the good from me is Ellie De La Cruz. He's just fine. Last week we were talking about the sky falling down. There were people in the chat room and on Twitter seriously saying Ellie De La Cruz needs to go to AAA. The man's in the midst of a pretty nice hit streak right now. I say you get him out of the damn six hole. He would have batted at the end of this game had he just been in the one, two, or three hole. Or even, for that matter, the four hole. Get him out of the six hole. The six hole's for the scrubs. Not the scrubs, but it's been this way for a long time. And for whatever reason, they've changed it analytically over the years. But your top four hitters are usually your dudes. Five can hit as well. And then six through nine, it's it's the guys that, you know, typically don't hit as well. Why have they switched that over the years to where we now are seeing Spencer Steer hitting seventh and De La Cruz hitting sixth? And I get it. You mix up the innings. You get six, seven, eight coming up to start a little rally. I just, I'm a traditionalist. Don't change it. Don't change what works. Well, D David Bell is, is very set in – setting a lineup and keeping it. And he was not like that when he started. And for whatever reason, I don't know if he just 
decided that it was too much on players to be moving them around in the lineup, and he's stuck with the lineup. There's really two ways that a manager can go about it. You can have the Joel Madden where you just literally – you have a different lineup every night, or you have a more traditional where you just try to keep a lineup set. Um, I prefer the Madden style. I prefer – you know, moving guys up and down and, and not putting guys in set spots and trying to get the, the maximum, maximal lineup, maximal optimal lineup out there, you know, based on not just right, left splits, but based on different pitchers, pitch mixes and all that. But if you're a guy that has a set lineup like David Bell, I think you got to stick with it longer than this. I think he has Ellie De La Cruz six, because he's trying to get him comfortable just like he did with Will Benson last year. I mean, Will Benson, to the dismay of a lot of this fan base, batted eighth and ninth almost the entire year because David Bell wanted to get him comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, I, whether you think that helped Will Benson or not, I mean, it's hard to argue that that Will Benson is is a, a not a better player right now than he was last year. So I think that's why um, Spencer Sears probably the one that does need moved up. I, 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 I know I get crushed on this. I, I do think people overrate Spencer Sears a little bit in – how good of a hitter he is against right-handed pitching. I think he's probably a a slightly above average hitter against right-handed pitching, which is why you see him batting sixth, second against lefties and seventh against righties. Um, but, I mean, I, I don't think Spencer Steer is going to matter where you put him in the lineup. I think he's going to produce just about anywhere. Um, but I think they also have Steer behind Ellie to try to give him some protection as well. So, um, I don't know. I, I just... I'm not a guy that really gets too upset about lineups just because any study you look at, it doesn't really increase your runs at the end of the year all that much. So if if David Bell thinks that Ellie's more comfortable sixth, I'm fine with that. It doesn't really bother me. Ellie forces Milwaukee's only air in the game as they have to rush a throw because it's Ellie and he's the fastest dude in baseball. Um, is that factually correct, fastest dude in baseball, or are we looking at – potentially someone else that um, has wheels but isn't really a good player. I believe he was the fastest last year. Um, Bubba Thompson's like was like fifth, I think. So they're, they're right there uh, uh, neck and neck. But he got on base a couple more times today, had an RBI. Uh, De La Cruz ups his average to 293 on the season, his OPS right near 1,000. It's early, but uh, no worries about Ellie for me. I will say this. Um, last year around the All-Star break, 2023 All-Star break, Ellie Day or La Cruz was like right around the uh, Kyle Schwarber 28 percentile range when it came to striking out batters. I don't know if you saw this on uh, MLB Network. Since the All-Star break last year, he's in like Joey Gallo territory. I mean, no one's striking out more than Ellie Day La Cruz. We all know that. All he needs to do is put the bat on the ball whether it's from rocket shots off the bat because he improves his plate discipline or just take some walks, whatever it is. He doesn't even need to put the bat on the ball. He just needs to not strike out. Do anything but strike out, and he's putting so much pressure on the defense, man. It is fun to watch. Did it again today. But um, De La Cruz, a bright spot for the Cincinnati Reds. You give me something. Give me something to cheer about from a man that's always positive. Even when the Reds are losing 110 games, he can look down at Chattanooga and say, hey, Lookouts are 500. They're coming. They got some talent down there. Give me something to be positive about. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, the first one we will start will be very positive because Louisville lost 13 to four to Columbus. Uh, tough night for the Louisville Bats. Even tougher night for Connor Phillips. He uh, he really struggled tonight. Uh, really struggled with his command. Only threw uh, 44 of his 78 pitches for a strike. Gave up three home runs. Now, Columbus, that's the uh, Guardians AAA affiliate. Uh, they do have a really good lineup, but uh, but a tough night nonetheless for uh, Connor Phillips. Uh, Mike Ford had another home run. He's already got three. Connor Capel also hit a home run. He's already got four uh, home runs. Uh, Blake Dunn over four. Reese Hines uh, one for three. Chattanooga AA, they were rained out tonight. Uh, but Dayton, they actually just went final seconds ago. Uh, that's the, the most exciting team, the team that I'm most excited about, Chuck. They won 7-4 over Grand Rapids. A lot of good performances in this one. Cam Collier was 2-4. for four. Hector Rodriguez 2-5 for five with a triple. Uh, Jay Allen looks like he's uh, a lot more comfortable after uh, really having a tough year last year. was injured almost throughout the entire year. He had a home run. He's already got two. This guy, I think he only hit – he might only hit two all of last year. 
And then Carlos Jorge, he uh, had a homer as well tonight. So good night for him. And then uh, Daytona, they lost 4 nothing to Palm Beach. Uh, not a whole lot going on in this one. Uh, Ricardo Cabrera was on, on base three times. Uh, Alfredo Duno over two with a walk. That's your Reds MILB. Reds MILB, I love it. I said we're going for a rubber match tomorrow. Two seconds into the show. Statistically just wrong. It's a four-game set. We're already dealing with the four-game sets. Throwing off the host. I have one job to be factually correct, and I can't even do it, Kirby. Anyways, Reds take on the Brewers tomorrow. Another 540 first pitch. 6-5 is Cincinnati. 7-3 is the Brewers. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, game tomorrow in just a second and the rest of the series. But I want to pivot over to TJ Antone who's on a mission right now to have a Disney movie made about him. When everyone saw him walking off the field, what was it, um, Saturday, Sunday, wh whichever day it was, getting the days mixed up too. Factually, just I, I'm all over the place. Who cares? I don't care about facts. Not a facts podcast. Kirby gives the facts. I just run us through. Um, Antone goes down, and as he's walking off the mound, we, we all felt like the inevitable was coming. You know, that, that's a career. Antone... He just uh, he can't stay healthy. Good pitcher. Show, showed a lot of flash back in 2021, but for whatever reason, uh, the game has not been kind to him. He's on a mission right now. He said, I think I have an opportunity and responsibility to do this not only for myself, but for other kids out there dealing with Tommy John. The cool thing about baseball is that contracts are guaranteed. There's kids out there in high school and college, their careers are over, and they just don't have the best medical attention in the world. I think I have an opportunity to be the person that makes it back from there. I know I have the perseverance. I know I have the work ethic. And with them, mixed with the medical experts that are around, why not me? He says he's going to go out there, and when he comes back, he's going to plan on throwing hard again, not switching up his game. He's going to try to be the pitcher that he was in 2021. And he said, guess what? If it doesn't work, if there's a setback, whatever it may be, we'll hang it up, but I'm not going down without a fight. How can you not love TJ Antone? Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cool stuff. It, I I can't even believe he's not just just calling it right there. I mean, after the 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 just the the tough luck that he's had over the last couple of years, uh, he's a hell of a competitor. Uh, I know I said it the other night, but I think he's got a great career after baseball ends. I think he's going to be a guy that that teams are going to want to be around their young players. And obviously, he's already like kind of starting that coach's mentality right now. So uh, whether T.J. Antone's uh uh, a pitching coach or a minor league coordinator or hell, maybe even a, a big league manager. Uh, I think he's the kind of guy that, that, that has a, a, a bright future um, after his, his playing career is over for sure. I was talking about this the other day and I know it's completely off the beaten path right now of what we're talking about on the J bar, but we did get into a little bit of Ellie De La Cruz and how he needs to work on the plate discipline because all that separates Ellie De La Cruz from being the face of baseball really is the ability to, to put the, the ball on the bat, the bat on the ball. And it's not even quite frankly, mechanics, which a lot of young people struggle with, like his mechanics, his footwork, um, you know, getting the drive off his back foot. Everything is, everything's there. Like, I feel like all he needs to do is take more pitches and, and have someone come in that mentors him and uh, teaches him a little bit about the strike zone. I think that person, Joey Votto, I'm sure at some point, that's been brought up many a times on this broadcast that Vado, who came in and, and saved, quote unquote, Will Benson's career, that maybe he comes in after he retires and can work a little bit with Ellie. I think that's the only thing he's missing, man. Vado and Ellie. <laughs> well, Vado's under contract with the Blue Jays right now. So, who uh, gives a damn about the Blue Jays? Can't, can't do anything there. We'll talk next year. Just come Joey. get him. I think Enjoy he's, Toronto. We'll, I think he's still on. I think, yeah. I think he's still on the IL as well, so that's also going to be a, a, a tough, uh, <laughs> a tough go about it. But one one thing about Ellie and and Trace has brought this up. Um, I, I know it's it's so easy to just want to put the ball in play, want to put the ball in play. It's it's a lot easier said than done, especially with a guy that that has the the game that Ellie De La Cruz has. I mean, Ellie De La Cruz hits 450 home runs. This isn't Billy Hamilton trying to to you know just tap the ball down the line. I mean, this is a guy that, that, that has immense power. So I think that that's what does make it frustrating for, for a lot of fans is that you see how, how much you can just wreak havoc on the game when he puts the ball in play. 
but that's also not just completely his game at the same time. Um, so it, it has to be a balance, and you don't want him to to go too far overboard where he's just so focused on putting the ball in play that what got him to this point, which is crushing baseballs, gets taken away from him. So it's it's a it's a balance there. Um, you know, it's I mean most of the the top hitters in in baseball strike out like 20 25% of the time. Um it's it's not it's not like it used to be where you know you had guys that uh, the, the your top hitters in the game um were contact hitters. I mean that's just that's a big part of the game today. Um and it's it's a it's a tough balance with Ellie, but um again, he's 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 just barely getting his feet wet in the big leagues. Um, it was nice. It's nice the the week that he had uh, after our show last week, Chuck, where the vibes were as low as they could be on Ellie De La Cruz. Um, it's completely flipped, and I think there'll be a lot of waves this year. Uh, I, it's not going to be just this nice upward trajectory that we would love. It, he'll have some some more slumps, uh, but I think at the end of the year, I think the the biggest thing you want to see is you want to see progress out of him. Uh, you want to see at the end of the year his overall numbers just be progressing some. Um, how much we'd love to see a lot, but if he's just progressing some, that's a good sign for the future. I want to see some progress from Hunter Green, who's got good numbers, no wins to show for it, no losses, a two five three ERA. He takes the hill tomorrow against his John Sadak would say, what does he say? An old friend. Look who it is. It's Wade Miley, uh, who threw a no hitter for the Cincinnati Reds, I believe against the, uh, against Cleveland in Cleveland during that shortened COVID season. Or it wasn't the shortened COVID season, but it was the uh, the beginning of the COVID year with no fans or 25% capacity, whatever it may be. But Miley, Hunter Green, tomorrow, little 540 action at Great American Ballpark. Third game of a four-game series. So not quite the rubber match, but Reds can sit in the catbird seat taking uh, two of the first three of this series. What are you most looking forward to seeing with Hunter Green tomorrow? Well, six forty. If you don't live in Chicago, I, I, most of our audience, I think, is wow. on the East Coast. So Sorry, I don't want I just, people I'm re- tuning I'm in straight at, off the at, app. At, I've been time zones galore, man. <laughs> I know it's tough. Well, I didn't realize how tough it is until we went on that uh, that road trip. And man, you you just you you're there like three days, and you're like, oh, I'm a full West Coast kind of guy on, on the time zone. But yeah, Hunter Green, I thought threw the ball really well uh, his second time out. Uh, first time was okay. Second time was really good. So I'm um, hoping for a big start for him tomorrow. Uh, Brewers are a team he has struggled with throughout his career. He's got a career ERA of 8.00. However, he did not face them at all last year, which was kind of surprising uh, when I saw that. Uh, Willie Adamas has two home runs against him. Uh, Christian Yelich has a home run. Uh, Wade Miley, this will be his first start of the season. He started the year on the IL. Uh, he made one rehab assignment down at AAA. Uh, through three innings, uh, only through 55 pitches. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how far they push him. He's got a career 2.86 ERA against the Reds. He threw six shutout innings against the Reds uh, in his only appearance against them last season. Need a W tomorrow, and that is Wednesday, because on Thursday it's Freddie Peralta against Nick Martinez. Just based off the box score, the Brewers obviously uh, will be the, uh, the the favorites there. They'll have the minus 120 or whatever it may be by their name with Peralta going up against Martinez. But I want to finish the show with a little stump the Kirby. Nick, you're ready for it. I got you last time. I'm going to try to stump you again. I stumped you already today, and I'm going to try to stump you again on the way out. The Reds made a trade many years oh, well, ago. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, Chuck. Hold on, Chuck. That, that first stumping. I mean, are we really calling that a full stump? Because that's I that's got not a stump. No, yeah, I that's, that's close Lee. enough. That's that's BS. That's, that's not a stump. Th- this would be a full stump because, in okay. my opinion, right, it's an right, easy right. trivia question, but I live for useless trivia questions. All right. Years okay. ago, all I right. don't have the exact year, the Reds traded a young Felipe Lopez and Austin Kearns to the Washington Nationals and received these four players. Uh, full credit for four. Um, if you get three, I won't. I won't entirely say that the uh, the Kirby had been stumped. I'll say that you get partial credit. All right. So Felipe Lopez and uh, Gary Majeski. There's one. Todd Coffey. Don't help him out, chat. No, that's already wrong, but I'll let you keep going. The Kirby's been stumped, but he can keep going. And this was when I was in college. This was uh, my uh, – 
My my uh, not as uh, following days on a day to day basis. I'm not looking at the chat. Um, who else came from Washington? We had it's, Royce it's Clayton relievers, right? Royce Clayton popped into that trade. There's two. Oh. Okay. We had a high Sox reliever, a lefty that that popped in there for a minute and had a had a stint with the Reds. Was it Daniel Ray Herrera? No, it was a uh, Bill Bray. Ray, oh, Bill Bray, Bill Bray, Bill, Bill Bray, Bray, number yeah. three, and then number four. This one may even stump the chuck. Um, it's not going to stump the chuck. It was Ryan Wagner. I think he was number four there. So there's stump the Kirby for the second time this season. The biggest Reds fan on planet Earth watches every single game. Has been stumped by useless trivia, and we're going to continue to stump him throughout, uh, I guess, Tuesdays, right? It's, it's Chuck and Kirby on the ones and twos on Tuesdays moving forward, or is Trace going to take his seat back, and I'll, I'll see you guys in June? Trace is, uh, Trace is a roller coaster, uh, so uh, uh, you never know. We'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, be sure to let you know, but um, you just you never know. You might be called into action uh, 20 minutes before a show starts here at some point. Okay, as long as we can finally get a W, man, I'll take it. Chatterbox Reds, send the people out with a little note, Kirby. Good stuff, my man.